The renaissance of automotive classics celebrates the resurgence in interest, restoration, and preservation of historic and iconic cars. This movement underscores the cultural and historical significance of classic vehicles, emphasizing their impact on automotive design, technology, and society. Classic cars, typically over 20 to 30 years old, are restored using authentic parts and techniques. Iconic models like the Lamborghini Miura, Mercedes-Benz 540K Special Roadster, and Bugatti Type 57 Stelvio showcase the evolution of design and engineering excellence. Restoration involves disassembly, inspection, bodywork, mechanical overhaul, and interior restoration, all aimed at maintaining historical accuracy. These cars are symbols of their eras, reflecting technological advancements and cultural trends. Events and auctions highlight the ongoing enthusiasm for these vehicles, preserving automotive heritage for future generations. This resurgence allows new audiences to appreciate the rich legacy and historical significance of classic cars, emphasizing the value of restoration beyond aesthetics or financial gain. Bruce, get, get us started. How have you seen the appreciation for classic cars evolve over the years? Okay, let me just mention, I, I saw the video. I, I couldn't hear a thing. Could, could, did anybody else hear anything from that? Yeah, I could hear. Anybody okay, else? Okay, I, 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 didn't, I didn't hear a thing. It just, all I saw was, uh, you know, just, so, so uh, the question is, as far as appreciation, is that is that where you're going with this? Yeah, curious how you've seen the evolution okay. of people's love for classic cars. So, so for sure, I'm the oldest here. Um, you know, in my mid eighties and I've been doing this really since birth, I've loved cars since birth and I've never really bought cars with the idea of appreciation. I've just tried to buy the best example. And I think if you buy the best example, you know, the, the, the appreciation will follow. I think appreciation has also come from the cost of doing restorations and, and just the general, you know, upkeep and so forth has has those prices have increased and maybe the values along with them. I mean, I bought some cars that have been great and I've never bought them with the idea of appreciation. So I might, I might be the wrong guy here because I buy them all out of passion and I try and buy the right one. Okay. Well, not even not looking at it as an investment, but has there been an evolution in people's love for classic cars? Like how has that changed since you were a kid? Well, what's interesting is, um, so I started, in, in like 1970, I bought my first car uh, that I still have today. It's a, a Ferrari, and that's gone up appreciably. But at the same time, I, I had a love for Packards and Pierce Arrows, and, and, and they have not appreciated so much. Um, you can buy those cars today for less than the price of restoration. If you, if you, if you bought a Porsche or a Ferrari, you've probably seen some pretty significant gains. Um, I think that has a little to do or, with the, the age group that are buying the cars now. Um, you know, I, I'd probably I'd be more interested in hearing what what uh, you know Philip Grio has to say. I'm a big fan of of the of the family, and and it's nice to see you here. Yeah, nice to be here. Thank you. Yeah, Philip. So your thoughts? Yeah. Well, it's it's a difficult question for me at 35, uh, to answer, I know from, you know, my childhood, I, I experienced, I have watched a lot of change. I think just in the way people have enjoyed automobiles. I think I grew up on the Concours lawn. I grew up in uh, race paddocks and whatnot. Um, and I remember when, uh, my dad had a P4, uh, Mira P400S that he bought for 25 grand and they weren't <laughs> worth restoring at the time. And he still, you know, we're not allowed to talk about Miras in, in this household anymore, uh, mainly because that changed, you know, it rapidly changed. And um, I think there was a time where they were just cars um, and people who were overly um, enthusiastic about uh, just owning them because they were beautiful uh, and they appreciated uh, the history of them. 
the sounds of them, just the raw nature of them. Um, I think those people are still, they're still here. And if they were lucky enough to hold on to some of these uh, really special cars, then, then they've done quite well. Um, but I think in the last 10 years, you've seen some, um, I think some maturing of, of automobiles as a marketplace. Um, funny that you mentioned, um, you know, the, you know, a, a previous podcast about watches and the similarities there. And I had a conversation with a, um, with a tech, I, I won't say a, he was in tech and he was concerned that, um, you know, at some point EVs would completely replace classic cars and whatnot. And I just can, I compared it to a Casio watch that came out and essentially made a Rolex, um, you know, irrelevant in the sense of telling time and accuracy and, and whatnot, but it, it became even more powerful in regards to uh, what it said about someone's personality or someone's taste. Um, and I think cars, especially right now, with it, the abundance of capital and markets right now and the maturity in the car market, um, they've seen a, a, a rapid appreciation, not just in terms of, uh, you know, fandom, but also in, in valuation as well. So, Philip, in this like current renaissance of classic cars where you saw the Ferrari Mura, like it, it changed a lot. And what do you think is driving that renaissance, especially among younger generations? Um, among younger generations, I think it's a little bit different. I think, you know, the, the Mira stories was classic, you know, there's not that many of them and, um, you know, they're expensive to restore. I think at the time it was a $25,000 car that cost about 250,000 to restore at the time. I think it was 2000. Um, and, but right now with people my age, it's really that, well, at least for, you know, cars built after 2000 that are now considered classic or 1990 to 2000, which are considered classics. Those cars were never built. I think with the, um, I, I don't think they were built with the mentality that they were going to be valuable 30 years, um, from, from their, from the day they rolled. I don't think any of these cars were for a while. Um, and so it's hard, even though the production volumes are higher than the older cars that, you know, I think Bruce is well known to collect. A lot of these cars were beat up. They were junked, they were thrown away. And so the generation, uh, the millennial generation is probably looking at cars where you have this, uh, concentration now of design elements and modern cars that are becoming less and less or more and more impersonal. Uh, really hard to stand out when everyone has either a Model X or a Model S in a parking lot and you get to choose between black, white, or silver. Um, you know, you see a lot of, I don't know, I, I think you see a lot of overlap between all the manufacturers today. And I think my era is looking back and saying, okay, well, how much is it to buy, you know, a 1995 Range Rover Classic and make it operate at you know, modify it slightly so it operates uh, safely and um, and it looks great. And I, I think that's that's where my age is going back to is just really great looking cars with all the knowledge of how to, you know, kind of repair and uh, remove all the issues that came, were inherent to those when they were new uh, and just have fun. So that's that's where we're at. Lauren, I'm curious to see what your thoughts are. And I do want to ask you, like, how do you explain the enduring appeal of classic cars to a modern audience that's increasingly focused on, like, technology? Well, there are some classics that will always be of value. And I know Bruce will agree because I think he has a couple of these. But, like, you're talking about a 65 Shelby. That's a vehicle that is a classic that will always hold its value. Um, we monitor all and we attend most of the auctions around the country. And also we restore and collect 
uh, old Mustangs. So for me, that is my passion. And we've noticed the shift in collector cars. Uh, we own a company called Classic Tube. We make pre-bent tubing products for brake lines, fuel lines, and so forth. And so we've got a really good feel for the market when we're getting calls for really like a lot of Fox body chassis, which is 79 Mustang to like 87. We're seeing a lot of pull for that. And I find it interesting because to me, that was a car I had in high school. So you can do the math. But and when you think about it, it's the cars that we drunk, we lusted after in high school are what the next generation is looking at. And my kids are in their thirties and they understand the early Shelby's and actually my daughter's name is Shelby, but the uh, their lust for cars is different. For my son, it's Porsches. He he want, I have a Porsche in the garage he would like to have, but he's not going to get. But my son-in-law has one as well. And it's funny that Porsches will always work across all, it's like Ferraris and, and like Lamborghinis and all of the great cars. Like I know Ed has a couple of very awesome vehicles. Those are the kind of things that people will always lust after. But when you're looking at other vehicles, muscle cars, for example, like if you were trying to buy a 55 to 57 Chevy, you can get them dirt cheap now. Where when I was a kid, you couldn't get near them. But the kids today, they're not interested in the 50s cars. You, a Model T and a Model A was six figures when I was younger. And now they can't sell them to save their lives. And, and it's funny because I'm on the board of directors for the Pierce Arrow Museum here in Buffalo. And we can access some of those vehicles now for our collection for our museum at reasonable prices because they're just not holding their value. So you have to for us, how we got into it was you buy what you love, the car that you've always wanted, which typically is a car from high school. And that car that you've always wanted, your neighbor had it, your uncle, your brother, whatever it might be. When you own that car, you buy it because you like it. If it goes up in value, great. If it doesn't, you won't be sitting on a Carmen Ghia or something and thinking, oh my gosh, I bought this thing because someone told me it'd be worth something. And I know a lot of people that have done that. They bought cars exclusively because they thought that they would go up in value. And it's hard to do that when you're talking about muscle cars in general. There are certain specific vehicles that will always do well. 63 split window coupes. I mean, certain cars that you let's like, even the, for now, the new cars, a Demon 170, that's a collectible for now. Will it be a collectible down the road? Well, it depends how many they make. And so there's, we see a lot of that going on as well. I have a Ford GT uh, 2017. That's a collectible because there's not a lot of them produced that year and there's very few heritages. So when you want to buy something, you want to look for that provenance that gives it significant value down the road. It's got to have limited production. It can't be a mass production car like a dark horse Mustang. They're going to make as many as they can sell. That's not going to help you down the road. If, if you're looking to get into the Ferrari market, you might be able to get into a 308 at a reasonable price. But the problem is you have to look at the maintenance side of those type of things. And I think people forget about when they buy a really cool car. And I, I know that Ed knows this for a fact because we talk about this, he and I, that when there's um, when you buy a car, then you don't think about the maintenance, the insurance and all that. It all adds up. And then you realize maybe I shouldn't have purchased this car. So you should always look into truthfully what you what your passion is and then do a deep dive into it. Use those forums. Talk to other people. Go to car shows. Go and, and talk to people. Hey, what do you like about this car? Wouldn't you would what wouldn't you buy? I mean, there's a lot of cars I'd like to have. And after talking to the owners, I'm like, you know, maybe that's not going to work, especially if you're looking at it from an investment standpoint, because you are putting a lot of money into that. And there is a maintenance side to everything. Ed, you're uh, crowdsourcing. Well <laughs> Thank you. Ed, you're crowdsourcing with VinWiki. Do you see that sort of like the changing taste for? different types of cars with different age groups and that movement? We do. And, you know, inevitably value, as has been discussed, follows legitimate enthusiasm. And the reason that we see an evolution of the car market is we see an evolution of the new buyers in vintage cars as the whatever is vintage changes. And so most of us that have loved cars for a while remember the explosion in value of muscle cars that kind of started about 20 to 30 years ago because the people who grew up loving them started to mature in life and in credit and in financial ability. And so they started to buy the cars. And so I, what we see today is that the people who grew up loving 80s and 90s cars finally have the ability to start participating in that marketplace. And these new entrants into the market are what we're seeing, you know, add to the successes in value because they're like, I do want to live with a Diablo or an XJ220 or an EV110 or a 930 or whatever it is. And all of these cars, the values reflect that because the transaction velocities reflect that. And the utilization is there 
because a lot of these cars can be made quite functional. You know, that was sort of the era where especially a lot of the European sports car manufacturers started to build cars that were at least somewhat viable for regular use. And so different than a Countach, you might say, people are putting real miles on Diablos on the ones that they're comfortable with. Now, my personal attitude has always been diametrically opposed to Bruce's because I buy the worst examples of the coolest cars because that's all I could possibly afford. And I've been able to do so a little bit ahead of my generation just based on building up bulletproof credit over the years. And so as long as the banks keep being willing to you know, lend me money, I can invest in the cars that I grew up loving. And so for me, when I'm 16 years old in 2001, the Lamborghini Murcielago comes out. And for me, nothing can ever be cooler than that because it was the coolest car at the time that I was so dreaming about every possibility of recreating my own version of Cannonball Run with a vertically opening doors. And fortunately, I've avoided the spandex to go with it. But that car will probably go crazy 10 years from now because at that point, more people will be sufficiently financially established enough to, to do that. Now, what, so what does that mean right now for pre-war cars and the really significant cars of the 50s, 60s, and 70s? We don't know. And, and that is the real uncertainty in the broadest sense for the collector car market. And that's why everything that Bruce does and kind of his cohort of people that have supported and championed the market and the idea and the representation of some of these cars is so critical. Now, we did see something kind of for the first time out of nowhere this January in Scottsdale where muscle cars and resto rods went insane. And w cars that were that should have brought two hundred grand brought a million dollars. And the best theory there is that the baby boomer generation is retiring and they're bored and they have a lot of money from either saving or selling businesses or some other liquidity and they are putting it all in the market. And so, as we've seen so many different financial, you know, aspects of the world coming into play, there's a lot of really really wild stuff going on. We did a video recently where we looked at how many million dollar cars there were on earth. And we dove into exactly what it was. And I had done the same type of a video five years ago in 2018. So I guess I did it a few months ago. It was actually in 2023. And we went back looking at 2003, which is kind of, we just used that because it was right before the Ferrari Enzo came out. And there were between 1,000 and 1,500 million dollar cars on earth. In 2018, there were just shy of 20,000 million dollar cars on Earth. And last year, there were 30,000, a 50% increase in the span of five years. And so you look at what, at how much more capital is in the collector car market, and that is reflective of who is putting it in and how much enthusiasm there is for the cars. Bruce, anything to add? No, I think it's really well said. Um, I I really couldn't add anything, but but it it, uh, it is one thing, you know. Ed drives his cars, and and the Ferrari set generally didn't drive their cars so much. Uh, the Porsche people have always driven their cars, and now I'm finding low mileage Porsches are a big deal. I think if it came down to one mark that kind of hits all generations as Porsche. Um, that just is such a strong brand. It's so it's been so well managed. It's, it's not unlike Rolex. They've they've watched who their 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 uh, buyers are, the the demographic. They do well in races. They do well with intellectuals. They do well with driver drivers. And um, you know, I I, I kind of lean towards Porsches. I've been driving them since 1960, but um, I also like the Mustangs and I like all the Shelby cars and, and I just bought a car from the Griots. So, you know, I, 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 you know, I just buy what I like, I like the look of it. And it has, for me, it has to look great above all. There've been some, I've got a lot of hot rods, but unless, and there's some really ugly, awful hot rods. And I've never bought one of those. I've only bought the, the best looking. So I think the aesthetic is very important to me. Anybody else want to chime in before we move on to the next segment? Let's go to segment two.